Hi, this is Luna with Luna Perspective. Today's episode of Luna Perspective will be talking about 30XX. Before we dive into the main subject of this video, I want to take a moment to talk about how deeply I appreciate the feedback on my previous video. I was astonished to see the video continue to constantly gross views and break my expectations. My firm belief was that the video would only garner 70 views and then collect dust until the end of time. I am not someone who tries or even wants to get swamped in analytics. I feel that having a neck deep obsession with stuff like channel stats can lead to a death of passion, which would go against entirely why I'm doing this. I never intended when starting this to make this a career or a job. If I did, I'd burn out before finishing my first major project. As I mentioned near the end of my last video, I just wanted to start making content as a hobby, going into meticulous depth about topics that I feel are underdeveloped or aren't discussed enough in online spaces. But I'd be lying if I said seeing the video do as well as it did didn't make me feel ecstatic and constantly keep tabs on how the video was doing. I was floored from how much reception the video received, and not only that, but just how positive that reception was. I wanted to take this time to simply thank you all for the overwhelming support you've given me. Seeing all the positive feedback definitely kept me cozy while I was recovering from being sick. Seriously, I can't emphasize enough how much it means to me that people loved what I made. Your words filled me with more passion than I initially started with. So I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and I'm going to continue to improve my work and produce the best content I can. This passion isn't going away anytime soon. Thank you all. <laughs> May the moon always shine for you. Now, let's jump right into talking about 30XX. Before we get started, let's begin with a little history lesson. Chris King is the founder, programmer, and lead developer at Battery Staple Games. Chris quit his job working in cybersecurity to create the Mega Man game of his dreams. Because in his own words, Capcom wasn't doing it. And so began the production of Chris's dream game. He would go on to create a Kickstarter in early April of 2014 showing off footage of the in-development Echoes of Eridu. Echoes was already in development as of July 2013. However, in order for Chris to complete the game, he desperately needed crowdfunding. Despite already saving money from his job before he quit, it was still not enough to reach the full scope of his ambitions. The Kickstarter would barely meet its goal of $20,000 by just a few hundred to spare. With the Kickstarter being a success, Chris and the rest of his team would go on to complete Echoes. With assistance from folks at Firehose Games, Chris was finally able to put out the game. However, it was no longer Echoes of Eridu. It was now 20XX. The game was a blend of roguelike elements with the classic jump and shoot style of Mega Man X. Launching on Steam in early access, 20XX would see constant bi-weekly updates for nearly three years. 
finally reaching its major 1.0 update on August 16th, 2017, performing well enough to see ports on home consoles in the following year, like the PS4, Xbox One, and even onto the Switch. 20XX's story is about Nina and Ace, two contractor robots who are the unfortunate test subjects of two cruel scientists, Dr. Brighton Sharp and Dr. Arlon Flatt. Sharp began the fledgling project in hopes of creating life that could succeed humanity. Sharp was able to use the most advanced technology in the world to develop soul-capturing devices, allowing for our life to be immortal as long as it could find a body to inhabit. Sharp also managed to design robots with something akin to free will. Dr. Flat was working in tandem with Sharp as well to create the ultimate testing facility that could help Sharp's efforts in creating something to supersede mankind. They combined their scientific efforts to begin the contractor project, a combination of Flat and Sharp's life's work. Throughout the game, the roguelike gameplay of dying and restarting over and over again is used to help illustrate the narrative. Every failed attempt is an undesirable Nina and Ace that the doctors do not need. The entire story and events throughout the game can be blamed on Sharp and Flat as well. The entire reason the city is under attack is because of them repurposing old machines and conducting awful experiments. Eventually, through countless tests, Nina and Ace finally pass all the thresholds of the project, even completing the final task of killing both Flat and Sharp. The doctors planned for their deaths, as they both knew it was an inevitability, but one they were fully okay with. They served as the final test to prove if Nina and Ace were truly able to surpass humans. Now, segueing from the story to talk about gameplay, visuals, and music for a moment, 20XX is a game that I feel looks a little... Well, it's not as great as it could be. And this is a phrase you could use to describe everything else in the game. 20XX feels underdeveloped. However, it was an important proof of concept for Chris going forward. It clearly displayed there was massive potential in a game that's a fusion between Mega Man X and a roguelike. A title that could be absolutely groundbreaking in the indie game landscape. Chris and his team have been able to produce a phenomenal game that despite its shortcomings was able to find a decently sized community of fans, including me. But that is all there is to really talk about with 20XX. And I don't want to spend half the video on something that's not even the main topic. I did feel it was important to talk about it though. So let's move on to the sequel and the main subject of this video, 30XX. <sighs> Thirty XX's story takes place a thousand years into the future from 20XX. Nina is awoken from a multi-century long stasis and is ready to fight for justice once again. Not alone, she still has her companion Ace, along with the guidance of a scientist named Alexia. Together, they fight to bring an end to a wave of hostile robots and the mysterious antagonist, Eleanor, the architect. Along with the new and far more complex storyline, you have the available roguelike mode to play, in addition to the new Mega Mode, simulating a traditional experience like one you would find in the Mega Man X series. Eight bosses, infinite retries, but still retaining new features from its roguelike elements, like random upgrades and stage layouts. From here, I want to talk about the core of 30XX and detail it in depth. Let's just talk about one of the most important things when it comes to really any game. Gameplay feel. 30XX has made immense strides to improve over the first game. Movement feels wonderful, and control over your character is unbelievably tight. Jumping, dashing, and shooting all feel like they would in a Mega Man X game. It is one of the most enjoyable games I have played in recent times, due in large part to just how good the controls are. I'm a massive fan of any game with good movement, and 30XX takes that box perfectly. When the act of simply platforming feels fun by itself, you know you've made a good game. 30XX has not only innovated upon its movement, but its systems and mechanics as well. 30XX as a whole feels like a complete evolution of its predecessor, breaking limits and reaching far beyond what is in comparison a mechanical stone age. With the introduction of the core point system, you are able to mix and match different core upgrades and create powerful unique synergies. No longer are you limited to using one piece of armor corresponding to a body part. You can equip every set in the game 
Granted, you have the core points to do so. Draco Pent and Armor Torts, for example, are a powerful combination of armor sets that can make you a monster. Don't forget the fact that when you complete a set, they still have their bonuses as well. Since we're on the specifics of sets, I want to mention a new addition in 30XX, which is the Resonator set. This is effectively the same as armor parts for X. These spawn in random challenge areas throughout different stages, requiring you to beat a gauntlet. Gauntlets are chambers loaded with enemies that end in a mini-boss. Each piece of the Resonator set increases the effectiveness of core parts. If you have the double jump core and leg resonators, you gain a triple jump. Not only does it increase the effectiveness of your core parts, if you gain a resonator but lack the body part it corresponds to, you will be given one to use with it. Whilst it is a random core, it's better than nothing. The resonator is a welcome addition, and it makes Nina and Ace look sick as hell as well. But that's enough about armor cores. Let's talk about Nina's weapons. Back in 20XX, Nina was limited to only one weapon core. Forkalator was a powerful triple shot pattern that was potent in close range. Wave Beam was another option to give Nina curving shots. These could go through walls, but of course their pattern was wavy. None of Nina's weapon cores were compatible in any way, so you were stuck with one or the other. In 30XX, you can use both at the same time. Having both equipped causes their shot patterns to fuse into a unique state. This example though is a little inefficient for actually shooting at enemies. But in tandem with certain augs, it can create a large screen clear of devastation. Currently in the game, as of patch 1.1, there was a staggering amount of projectile combinations for Nina. She went from having only four buster options, five if you include her base buster, to a whopping 22 options in 30XX. You can wear all of them at once, provided you have the points available to lock them in, and none of them counteract each other. Ace has also received the same amount of love when it comes to variety and synergies in his possible runs. Now, the nerd in me wants to make a section just talking about projectile combinations on Nina, but this video would easily be six hours long if I did that, so... Let's move on to something else. <laughs> the presentation of 30XX has changed completely, transitioning from its cartoonish, almost flash theme aesthetic, now sporting wonderful sprite work by Globber Kotaki. That's how you say his name right. Pronouncenames.com Glaube Seriously, if you don't know about him or follow him already, you need to. His work is striking. His animations are beautiful and fluid. I can't sing enough praise of his art. I first discovered Glover's work all the way back from Duelist and have been in love with his style ever since. Since we're on the subject of Glover, he also had a Mega Man X inspired game in the works around 20 years ago. The game revolved around a protagonist named Delta who, let's just say, his design inspirations were worn on his sleeves, and his legs, and his chin. Unfortunately, his project never came to fruition and was ultimately retired mid-development. Despite this setback, he remained passionate about game development and continued to provide his sprite work for video games. Delta was deeply important to him and was an important element into why he even started getting into game development. As the years went on, he still carried that dream with him. The dream of someday having his OC in a game. So, what if I told you that during the development of 30XX, Chris King gave him the opportunity to finally make his dream a reality? Glauber had been originally hired to create the sprites and animations for the game, as you already know. But sometime during development, he was given the chance to have Delta put in the game as a unique NPC and boss fight. When I found out about this, I literally rustled in my seat and yelled, Yo! I was so happy reading about this. It nearly brought me to tears. 
<laughs> I can viscerally relate to the enthusiasm of OCs and finding creative inspiration from them. I started learning video editing because of just how deeply entrenched I was in my characters. I made art. I made music. I've done entire video projects for my OCs that would easily take over 20 plus hours of work. The love I have for my own characters gave me an endless abundance of energy and inspiration to create. <laughs> I wouldn't be here today making videos if it weren't for the fact that I learned how to do video editing from my OC projects. I am so thankful for my OCs. They are a core part of me as a person, and they will always continue to be. I am extremely grateful for awesome people like Chris, who helped someone's lifelong dream finally be realized. I hope someday that I can fulfill my dream too. Maybe we'll get a Luna Perspective game someday. Maybe sometime down the road. <laughs> I know this went on a lot longer than it should have, but this was way too important for me to ignore. Sorry. 30XX's improved visuals are a spectacle to behold. From its character sprites to stage backgrounds, the game is a living playable art piece. I can't gush enough about Nina and Ace's glow up from the previous title. They are so much better designed than... Well that, I won't lie. I do sort of miss Nina's old design. She was super adorable back then. But Nina looks a hell of a lot cooler in this iteration. Abandoning her helmet and long hair, instead rocking something short along with a more advanced body. The contrast between Nina in 20XX and in 30XX is astounding. They're like two completely different characters. Character visuals were just one of the many upgrades that 30XX received in the graphical department when transitioning from 20XX. Environments became gorgeous and are now brimming with unique flair that overwhelmingly outshine that of the first games. Backgrounds on stages like High Vault and Water Grab are absolutely dazzling. Others like Deep First have stunning animated backgrounds that can be easily obscured by the stage's foreground. This isn't to say that it takes away from the artwork. I'm just trying to say it's a very easy to miss these wonderful details when you're jumping and shooting right by it at high speed. Occasionally, I would idle, take a moment to appreciate the level of detail put into the backgrounds and realize, oh, yeah, I need to continue playing the stage, and move onward, still glancing back at the visuals from time to time. The game's presentation is remarkable. I could keep going on about it for hours. Globber did such an amazing job. I love his art to death, and his passion is truly an inspiration. Functioning perfectly in tandem with Globber's pixel art comes City Fire's music. City Fires has also worked on games such as Bar to the Future, Cat Lateral Damage, all of this in between releasing albums that aren't related to video games he's worked on. Which, by the way, you should really listen to. City Fires makes powerful and alluring music, like his track The Days of Loss. If you enjoyed the music you hear at all in 30XX, I wholeheartedly recommend you go check his other work. His bandcamp is linked in the description. They're all wonderful. Oh, and also, he does commissions. Please hire him. Seriously. Oh yeah, I was supposed to be talking about his contributions to 30XX. City Fire's compositions in 20XX were definitely one of the defining outliers within it. As previously stated, the game wasn't reaching its full potential, and that could even be said about its music. Sky Temple Stage is definitely my personal favorite theme in the game. Even still, I wouldn't say 20XX's soundtrack stuck with me at all that much after playing it. Now, in the case of 30XX, every single track is a banger. City Fires improved the music in every single way, from the title screen, to the hub, to each individual stage. The soundtrack is memorable, and I find myself listening to it while doing other stuff. It's difficult to pick a singular favorite, but if I really had to pick one and only one, I would have to give it up for Innovation's End. It gets the cogs in my last generation Reploid brain going. <laughs> It's such a bop. One of my favorite additions in the soundtrack for 30XX was the multiple variants of stage themes. Whenever you would encounter the mini-boss of a stage, the track would change to match the situation. This dynamic music adds a lot to the soundscape and breaks up the monotony of hearing the same theme for the 500th time. Not that I'd ever get bored of them, though. <laughs> My other favorite addition in the soundtrack was giving each individual boss a unique theme to coincide with them. It helped to differentiate them all beyond just their movesets and designs. Giving them an accompanying track that encapsulates not only the boss, but the stage and the aesthetic. 
For example, Hoot Omega's boss theme has perfect cohesion with his battle's gimmick and his design. I'll go more into depth about bosses soon. And don't worry, there won't be a boss fashion show or whatever. <laughs> I'd never reuse that joke again. Something that I felt 20XX struggled with was having its visuals and music combined in a way that felt like they synergized off of each other. The art style was disjointed from the soundtrack and never quite felt right. It's a bit difficult to explain, so I hope you understand what I mean here. 30XX on the other hand managed to create a unity of its style and music. In simplest terms, they were meant for each other. Finally segueing from the soundtrack, let's talk more about mechanics. I have already mentioned previously, Nina and Ace were given an in-depth uplift when it comes to run potential, variety, and their mechanics. But Ace hasn't been given time to shine in this video. I would feel remiss not mentioning some of the wonderful buffs he has now. Originally, Ace could only have four other weapon options to find in a run. His base weapon included making that a list of five individual weapons. 30XX brings his repertoire of possible arms up to nine. It is not nearly as extensive as Nina's projectile options, not even including the plausible combinations. Ace makes up for his lack of options by instead opting into sheer power. His weapons possess a new attack option called Unleash Blade. These are alternative attacks that have a unique effect coinciding with the weapon. For example, the Ace Saber's Unleash is a multi-hitting spinning blade that boomerangs back towards Ace after traveling a short distance, allowing Ace to deal high damage if he hits an enemy with the Unleash and his base weapon swings at the same time. Thanatos' Unleash marks an enemy for death, allowing you to kill a different enemy, resulting in both dying at the same time. Ace also has weapon augments only he can obtain, mechanically altering his weapons in a variety of ways. His spear weapon, Tonbokiri, has an obtainable aug, only letting it be able to do damage in a sweet spot. The benefit of this is that it does more damage. It has another weapon aug letting him stand on top of it, like Super Arrow from Mega Man. I mean, it makes sense. The upgrade is called Super Tonbokiri, so it's kind of an obvious reference. Now, I want to stop talking about character mechanics in depth from here on out and close this with a summary of Nina and Ace's development from 20XX to 30XX. Just an overall final thoughts on how these two developed and changed from their original designs. And before I read this, I just want to say it's going to come off as a little mean, but I want this to help illustrate the fact of just how far we've come. Nina and Ace were very one-dimensional, mechanically, in 20XX. They simply filled the archetypes they were inspired by. The game needed a jump and shoot character to fill the role of X. So we have Nina. We needed a slash and dash character to fill the spot of Zero. So we have Ace. Never did these characters express an identity of their own. They were simply derivatives of the characters they were directly inspired by, but surrounding them was a sea of possibilities. In the transition from 20XX to its sequel, the devs took the plunge and went far beyond the inspirations. 30XX gave them an identity while retaining the core tenets of what inspired them. Nina can fuse boss powers together while having a myriad of projectile combinations, giving her a near limitless arsenal. Ace's new mechanics like Unleash and the Style Meter fill out his kit while allowing him to fit into his own niche of hyper speed slash and dash hero. Not only is Ace incentivized to keep attacking and moving for his style meter, he is given significant bonuses for doing so. The mechanical bow tied on top of this present of design is the completely unique boss power selections Nina and Ace have. Nina gains a flaming projectile that can split into two, while Ace uses a flaming uppercut. Nina summons black holes to clear out ways of enemies. Ace can summon a doppelganger to double his strength. Chris and his team manage to further each character's individuality with the addition of character-specific augs, like a beam enthusiast and secret technique, respectively. Nina and Ace finally stand on their own two legs, brimming and leaking with character from their gameplay to their designs. I am in love with this iteration of them, and I hope in future updates or maybe even installments that they continue to evolve and never stop becoming more unique characters. And with that, I think we are finally done talking about playable character mechanics.
The playable cast isn't where the additional care and attention stops. We see this also throughout the non-playable cast. The bosses of 30XX are definitely a step up from their preceding counterparts. I will not lie or mince words here. 20XX's boss designs were very bad. And I don't want to be rude. I know these things take a lot of time, and I'm sure these ideas had potential, but they were held back in one way or another. Be that the creative experience under their belts at the time, not letting them bring out what they wanted to fruition, or limitations with the engine that could have cut the scope. Maybe the funding wasn't enough to give them appropriate time to develop these bosses further. It could be none of these factors, or it could be all of these in some form. I wouldn't know. But what I do know is that 30XX knocked it out of the park when it came to boss designs. They learned from 20XX's flaws and used their new knowledge to create what is, in my opinion, a colorful and memorable crew that all have phenomenally done visual design. If you remember anything from my X8 video, I'm sure you know what's to come next. It's time for the Maverick. Wait, they're not Mavericks. What are they canonically called again? Oh, okay. okay. The Guardian Fashion Show. Hi, hi, this is your hostess Luna, here in a new venue thanks to my wonderful artist, Izoka. <laughs> like the last time, we will be going through the contestants in alphabetical order, but unlike the previous fashion show, this time I bring a guest. <laughs> Give a wonderful round of applause for j -Z. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Welcome to the show, Jay. Now, let's finally begin. Our first contestant is... Absolution is the guardian of Penumbra, a cathedral filled with the faithful of the Sequence, individuals who regard Mina and Ace as mythological figures, and Eleanor as the ruler of this mythos, giving her the title of Shepherd of Spirit. This legion of devotees believe that Eleanor will save them from an event known as the Collapse sheltering themselves as well from the concept of other worlds and the horrors of them bridging, spending centuries assisting Eleanor in building something to achieve her mysterious goals. Now, there isn't a lot to go off of when it comes to the personalities of Guardians. There is a thread that ties most of them together, and that is their devotion and deep trust of Eleanor. So in this fashion show, we will be ranking them on aesthetics and their fights only. Visually, I find Absolution's design to be strong. Her wings of light are gorgeous, and I love this crown-like halo she has. Something small I specifically love is the trim of her skirt, along with these lights on the fake metallic folds of her pseudo-dress. Such minuscule but wonderful details. As for Absolution's moveset, she is a mostly stationary boss that will try to zone you out and trap you into tight spaces while pelting you from afar, occasionally changing her position after throwing a scythe and trailing behind it. I especially love the second phase when the music shifts and you fight this shifting stained glass wall, shooting fireballs to electrical projectiles and black holes. Overcoming this causes Absolution to come crashing through the window, along with the dynamically designed climax of the song. Let's move on to our rating, shall we? Do you have any words for us, Jay? Shorty cute, I'm a Romeo -ha. Overall, she is a solid design with little to no issues, and she's one of my personal favorites from the roster. The dynamic music within her fight is also a wonderful display of a feature not used enough in other boss encounters. I love her so much. <laughs> Capital Punishment is the Guardian Dustria, a facility originally abandoned now turned into a massive military production factory, creating endless amounts of weapons and assisting Eleanor in her plans. The factory and its denizens are deeply loyal to her and have been working nonstop for centuries to help her realize her goals. Not being based on an animal and designed similar to a humanoid, his appearance is a departure from the majority of the other guardians. Looking more like a robotic CEO of an industrial company, his visual design translates very well with how he fights. He refuses to get his hands dirty, so instead, 
he employs the use of giant mechanical fists he can manipulate with ease. These fists will become an active, allowing you to platform onto them and get your opportunity for damage in. Reminiscent of another boss, with giant fists you use to platform. He additionally incorporates the use of long-range projectiles to deter you from reaching him. As you whittle away his HP and reach his second phase, he loses his cool. His shades that once hit his eyes shatter, revealing his angered gaze as his body emanates and glows with energy, empowering all of his attacks. But with some good pacing and patience, he topples over completely. Jay, do you have any words for our contestant before we move on to the rating? Yeah, money smart, it's lit. Capital's boss fight is really fun. It's something I didn't really like at first, but it grew on me in time. And now it's one of my favorite Guardian fights among the first eight stages. His theme is also up there as a contender for best boss theme in the game for me. <laughs> my only issue is that how far the camera pans out. It can make it difficult to keep track of the smaller projectiles near the floor. But overall, he has a solid design with a fun gimmick that I enjoy. On to our next contestant. Delta. Delta is a confident go big or go home type of contractor who watches from the sidelines with his own intentions and goals that to Nina and Ace remain mysterious. Delta serves as Nina and Ace's rival. In game, he often appears offering an optional stage condition when you enter a level, giving you the opportunity to take a great risk for a potentially great reward. But on occasion, he will challenge you to fight him with said modifier, giving you the option of completing the stage to receive your reward, or going through him to obtain it early. Delta's fight drastically changes from playthrough to playthrough, as every battle with him he pulls a series of moves from both Nina and Ace, using these styles in tandem to take you down. You are never going to be quite sure what type of Delta you'll be fighting until you've already committed. There are also some conditions that can make his fight much more difficult, like concussion jamming, where being damaged at all will prevent you from using your attacks and powers for three seconds. While Delta doesn't possess any unique moves to call his own, he blends both of Nina and Ace's attacks so well, you almost forget he stole them from you. Though unlike Nina and Ace, Delta lacks fusions, and he doesn't have the style meter. Jay, do you have anything you want to say before we move on? I like it, I like it a lot. Delta has a fantastic design, and can absolutely be a protagonist in his own game, though I might be biased. <laughs> I fall head over heels for characters with scarves. I love his attitude, and he has a lot of potential for his character. If Battery Staple Games decides to develop him more beyond the data lore entries. Now that we have the lovely Delta out of the way, let's move on to our next contestant. Echo Beast is the guardian of Echo Cave a large underground network, home to strange resonant crystals. These crystals are able to emit signals, and often do it in sync. Though he is usually always sleeping with headphones on, he guards the crystals that are used in the production of Eleanor's plan. Echo Beast is a slow and lumbering guardian. He often sits in one place, his main form of movement being teleportation, and releases crystalline projectiles that when hit with specific moves, can be sent back, along with these infinitely ricocheting waves that will move around the room like a DVD screensaver. While not a particularly hard boss fight, in the late game, he becomes more of an endurance test. As Echo Beast reaches phase two, he will teleport far more often. This fight is, in my opinion, a little lackluster. The fight doesn't really pose any challenge, especially once you understand the patterns of the projectile bounces. Outside of that, Echo Beast hardly has any methods of damaging you, outside of the player just deciding to walk into him and take contact damage. But on a positive note, his design is really cute, and I love how he's somewhat inspired by an armadillo. He even has a rare move, where he will roll up into a ball and move across the screen. I also love that he's permanently wearing headphones. <laughs> it's really adorable. That's all I can really think to say. Do you want to say anything specific, Jay? Holy fuck, he's rolling with a Drake! <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Um, how much was it going to cost to have you feed? While I enjoy Echo's design and his music, I find that the fight itself is a bit underwhelming. 
he never really poses a threat. If I ever do die to him, it's because I'm not locked in. It's a fight that takes patience, and that's fine. I just wish he was a little more fun. Yeah. Next up, we have... Experiment 9. For short, I'll simply refer to it as 9 for the rest of this section. Nine is the guardian of the Watergrab Laboratory. Originally, the facility was for the simple study and research into a new form of propulsion systems. However, the military took interest and wanted to experiment with the effects of this new gravity on organic life forms. It is now one of the lone inhabitants of the once active facility, a place for the future and betterment of mankind. Now the remnant of a lab that doomed humanity. Nine's design is truly unique. The only thing you could vaguely say it is inspired from is an axolotl. It lacks upper limbs, but even without those, it still has its telekinetic tail to defend itself, along with being fully able to use the gravity technology with no issues. Though to be clear, Nine has no manipulation of gravity on its own. It is simply adapted to the technology. Within Nine's boss room are a set of gravity flipping tiles. If you've ever seen the gravity arrows from Gravity Man stage, that's basically what these are. Nine is a very fast enemy, and with higher stage scaling, it can be difficult to keep up with it, especially when it transitions from the floor to the ceiling over and over again. Constantly launching projectiles as you play a game of vertical jousting to get opportunities to strike. While challenging, it is a mesmerizing and rewarding fight. Nine has clear telegraphs that can easily be learned if you take the time to understand it. For me, this fight was one of the hardest in the first eight Guardians when I started playing, especially if I was on stage seven or eight. I could kiss goodbye to a run because I couldn't keep up with Nine and the gravity mechanic. Obviously, this is not to say the fight is badly designed. It is just in my opinion, and from what I experienced, a very challenging encounter. One that after playing for so long, isn't too tough anymore. Fight aside, Nine's visuals are gorgeous. They really knocked it out of the park. The boss intro animation is something I absolutely adore. You're not dealing with an individual playing a key role in a greater scheme. You are in a battle to the death with a monster that has no other motives in its mind. Do you have anything you'd like to add before you move on to the next contestant, Jay? Everything love PT King! My thoughts exactly. It's not me trying to make some clever joke. Experiment 9 is genuinely one of the best bosses in the game. Its presentation and mechanics are a blast to fight again and again. The entire fight is like a dance, and I love it. Alrighty, we're a little over halfway through the contestants now. Next up on the list is... Hood Omega. Now this is one I was dying to talk about. Hood Omega is the guardian of the high vault. His job is to keep the weather stable by periodically raining down heavy storms, functioning as a counterbalance to the ever superheating planet. Hoot Omega is not the only of his kind, however, as there are many other hoots helping keep the world a much more livable environment. Hoot Omega is simply the leading unit. Omega is a friend-shaped bird that constantly attacks with the use of lightning, generating large amounts of storms that zone you out. But the main gimmick of Omega's boss fight is that it is one long platforming segment where the player must chase him down and fight him in specific areas of the map. After damaging him enough, he travels further and further to the end. This stage is filled with elevators and spikes. While Omega's projectiles aren't necessarily hard to dodge, doing it in tandem with the layout of the level is what makes it challenging. Challenging. The fight is absurdly cool, to be honest. <laughs> I love the start of his fight. The entire sky and background are blanketed in storms. The music sets the tone so well for this high-speed fight. It's also a contender for one of my favorite tracks in the game. This fight can be a little challenging when you first play, but it's very simple once you understand how to properly position yourself. Alright, let's move forward to that rating. And as always, do you have any final words for us, Jay? It's, um, it's, lit, yeah. it's a fair fight, 
that goes above and beyond with its presentation. The encounter with Omega is utterly fantastic. I have nothing negative to say. He's been a boss I loved since the early access of 30XX. <laughs> Alright, let's proceed to our next contestant. Legacy is the guardian of deep verse. Originally, Legacy was developed to help with the simulation of small universes and potential realities with universal simulation technology. Legacy was a companion AI that was made to help us as scientists working and studying on potential worlds. Legacy's design is really cute. He's also one of the oldest guardians that you find within the game, and his design takes that into account by incorporating a less refined appearance. He looks dated, while still being a cool sci-fi robot. He has a display screen for a face and these blocky bits to his design. He really does seem like a robot that could have come from a light sci-fi 90s setting. Legacy's appearance is misleading though, because while he looks as cute as a button, he can and will absolutely wreck your shit if you're not careful. Moveset wise, Legacy conjures shapes and objects that function to protect him and to attack you, creating barriers of shapes that can be destroyed to large beams that rotate and slide across the screen. These are exceedingly difficult to dodge, and when you're in a run where you haven't gotten any upgrades for your mobility, yeah, it's tough. His theme is also a jam. <laughs> I could never get enough of it. Do you have anything you want to mention, Jay? She gonna make me slide with my dog like I'm Mega Man, for real. Legacy is a really good boss. While not mechanically deep, I still thoroughly appreciate his visual design. He just oozes personality, and I love that for him. Sporting a good theme along with it too. Legacy, my beloved. Alright, so we're slowly nearing the end of the fashion show, folks. Our time slot on the air is running out, and who better to mention than... Lethal Tempo is the guardian of Clock Zone. It, uh, that's about it. Doing research and double checking data logs, I realize there isn't actually any lore. It doesn't seem to be really connected to the plot either, which is very confusing, as the data lore entries found within the stage have no connection to Clock Zone or Lethal Tempo. I couldn't find any information online either, so all I can really say is it's the Guardian of Clock Zone. I decided to just ask the 30XX Discord if anyone had any info to provide, because at this point I was out of options. And... Nothing. Nothing at all. It seems like nobody really had any information either. Which is unfortunate, but I suppose it is what it is. So disregarding that, let's finally talk about the actual fight. Lethal Tempo's gimmick is that the boss is made up of four individual sections, all following the same pattern, shooting cogs into eventually shooting lasers. With the defeat of each piece, the boss progressively speeds up, still maintaining its attack patterns, only amplified. This boss is either the easiest thing in the world or a nightmare to deal with. You need to appropriately plan and damage each part until they're near the brink of death. That way, you can take them all out in a swift motion, keeping the boss fight simple. But if you don't do this, you'll soon find yourself struggling to find any chance to deal damage, as you need to dance around an endless wave of cog projectiles. The music in this fight isn't really memorable, and if I'm being honest, the visual design of tempo feels a little... empty? Like, there is almost no character whatsoever, as if it wasn't obvious by its lack of lore. It's just lame. I hate to say that, because it has a cool concept. It just isn't executed well. Where the hoes at? Never got them. They never get a W and that's pretty much the L about them. Well said. It's such a weird clash when you put it next to every other boss in the game. It has no lore, its design is weak, and the gimmick isn't even fun. City Fire's music, while nice, doesn't really save this boss from being an afterthought. It's deeply disappointing to me, but hopefully in a future update, this gets rectified. But with that aside, let's move on to the final contestant. Give a big round of applause for... Yeah. 
Primus is the guardian of the burning temple, originally a machine given the mundane task of searching for defects in products. He was decommissioned and left to rest in a scrapyard. This is where Eleanor stepped in, reviving the lifeless guardian and providing him with a new purpose to be faithful to the sequence and her. Additionally, creating a temple for defective machines to exist freely as long as they operate under the three tenets of Primus. Visually, he is rather simple, but I think that works to his benefit here. Despite the word Zen being present in his name, he exhibits the exact opposite qualities. Primus is brutal and will easily overwhelm you with barrages of flame attacks. After slowly chipping away at his health, he will enter his second phase becoming invincible as four totems are conjured. In order for him to become vulnerable again, all of these four must go down. While doing so, rows and lines of fireballs shoot across the screen. Once you've eliminated the totems, Primus will become enraged, throwing out attacks at ludicrous speed. This is where the fight becomes problematic, especially if you lack any options to destroy or block projectiles. You'll need to prioritize movement and positioning before even attempting to deal damage. Alrighty. Jay, do you have anything you'd like to say for our last contestant? He in sicko mode, hitting bitches front of back, he got a walking pigeon toad. Zen Primus is a nice boss all around, but he lacks a level of character present in other bosses. I do enjoy his basic design, but it is a little too basic. Despite the glaring flaws, he still presents a fight I enjoy, and I am glad it is in the game. I enjoy the rhythm of avoiding his fireballs and trying to take more risk to damage him. It's a very satisfying fight. The bosses in 30XX are consistently well designed, even if some of them fall a little short. I don't dread fighting any bosses outside of worrying if they might end my run. That is a good kind of dread for a roguelike, I feel. Props to Battery Staple Games for improving from 20XX and making a good, well-rounded roster of mainline bosses and going the extra mile by creating unique boss themes and fanfares for each of them. It's a clear display of dedication and passion that I deeply appreciate. Alrighty, Jay, that was the final contestant. Do you want to say anything before we conclude? I was never... Okay, okay, Jay, thank you. <laughs> That's all for the Guardian Fashion Show. Take care. Cut the mic before he gets the video taken down. Moving away from the bosses of 30XX, I want to talk about their stages. Now, since this is a roguelike and the level layouts change from run to run, it's pretty difficult to give a 100% thorough review of a stage, since I'd basically just be talking about all of the available screens and rooms that could be chosen from a list. And that doesn't sound nearly as fun though. So to compromise, I will talk about the stages broadly, fixating mostly on their appearance, gimmicks, and soundtracks. So, let's work our way backwards from the fashion list. Zen Primus' stage, Burning Temple, is an inferno-themed temple with shifting platforms and fiery spike-like tiles littered all around. Starting from outside the temple, we deal with various enemies like fire-spitting snakes, bees, and even disciples of Primus who fight similarly to him. As you cross into the temple, the mid-stage boss, Big Rolly, descends from the ceiling, chasing you across the entire area until reaching its boss room. If you're wise enough, you can get behind Big Rolly, and it becomes more of a training dummy than a threat. If you're unfortunate enough to not destroy him before it reaches the chamber, then you must contend with its new pattern of going along the walls and ceilings launching fireballs. This isn't too challenging, but on higher scaling, after dispatching of Big Rolly, you proceed through more of Primus' disciples, along with a high chance of seeing the Zen Totems, a destroyable object that gives an enemy a barrier until it is destroyed. This is also the section where you are likely to see lava pitfalls and wall traps that eject flame projectiles. Eventually, you come up to the entrance of Primus' boss room, and that marks Burning Temple cleared. A fun stage with really good music to boot. It's 100% in my top four levels in the game. Clock Zone is, if you could have guessed, Lethal Tempo's level. Inside are revolving cog platforms that come in different shapes, along with these gargantuan spiked balls. As you progress, 
You'll fight knights, bats, wheels, gear turrets, spiders, and these stationary enemies that constantly fire gears. While I dislike Lethal Tempo as a boss, his stage is definitely good. Going further in, we encounter the mid-boss, humbly named Gear Dumper. The gimmick here is reminiscent of Big Rolly, but this time, it's a race to the end. A pretty boring mid-boss, if I'm being completely honest. You are contending way more with the waves of enemies in your path than the actual mini-boss. It's disappointing and not challenging in the slightest. Further on are these ascending segments, with far more cog platforms and spikes. Enemies take a bit of a backseat throughout these portions, as it's primarily focused on platforming. Thankfully, the game plays really well, making these types of sections fun to go through. But I still can't justify putting it very high on my personal list. I don't think I'd even put it on my top six. Deep Verse is a really cool level visually. You are in this wireframe computer wonderland, contending with enemies that follow patrols, turrets, smiley balls, and even these digital snakes that attack in a movement pattern like the game they're named after. The music of Deep Verse is an extravagant and high energy piece that gives off immaculate vibes. I really dig the drums on this track too. They're so good. Deep Verse is populated with Yoko Block as platforms that appear and disappear on a timer, thankfully designed to show where the block will manifest, and almost always following a sequential pattern. There are these virus projectiles that go around the rooms with no real direction, along with giant lasers that block the path forward. You'll definitely want to get an item protecting you from stage hazards, cause trust me, this stage is filled with them. Approaching the mid-boss, we encounter Big Snake. That's seriously its name. Big Snake is much like the snake enemy we see earlier within the level, but this time with its own arena to spar in. As you whittle away its HP, the tail segment explodes, creating a four-way pattern that will shoot lasers. This mini-boss is like a mix of Bomberman and Snake. I love this mini-boss. It's always so fun to fight it. Delving deeper into the cyberspace paradise, we are met with more rampant waves of hazards. Though with proper execution and patience, you can easily clear this stage. And that's Deep Verse. This stage is above average for me in the rankings. I enjoy seeing it early and such, but the late game difficulty of this level is a bit much. Still, with proper patience, it can be overcome easily. Oh my goodness, I get to talk about High Vault. I love this level. I've already explained that Hoot Omega is a banger of a boss, and his stage is just as good. High Vault opens up outside in a vibrant city, with Penumbra in the background. The visuals here are absolutely beautiful. High Vault has these stationary sword enemies that will only become aggroed if you are on the same elevation as them. Air conditioner-like enemies that shoot wind either horizontally or vertically. You can tell by their sprite for which one specifically. High Vault has these cloud jump tiles in the background that give you an additional jump when passed through, indicated with them glowing and you getting a cool pair of wings. Also, let me just take a moment to talk about High Vault's theme because Holy, it is so damn good. I remember firing up the game when it was in early access, hearing this theme and being like, yeah, this game is going to be the GOAT. Regarding the rest of the stage, the midsection boss is a device raining down electricity, requiring you to platform up to reach and destroy it. This part of the stage is probably my least favorite. It's not bad per se, it's just a bit tiresome on replays. Plus the boss doesn't really have any variety, outside of how many projectiles are falling and how difficult the platforming is. But once that is over with, we move on to the descending section. A part of the stage that, while it's not auto-scrolling, definitely feels like it. You're continually falling and having air slow your descent. This section is so much fun. It makes up for the lame mid-boss. Once we hit the bottom, it's pretty much a straight shot to the boss doors, as we cross over a series of spikes and cloud jump tiles. I adore this level. I always try to save it for my 8th stage in my runs, because it's always a good kickoff for the last two areas in the game. High Vault is an immaculate stage, and it's my second favorite in the game. Water Grab is an enjoyable stage that can be a bit much to wrap your head around when you first enter. It's an overwhelming level that asks the player to understand far more mechanics to get by than the others. It's not a bad thing, it's just something that can be a bit arduous to new players. You need to understand the gravity flipping mechanic and the submerged mechanic. 
These two are vital for completing the stage, as the enemies are a cakewalk. Platforms change depending on the status of the room's water. If it's touching certain platforms, they'll appear, and others will disappear. There are levers that allow the flipping of these water sources as well. All the enemies present in the stage also change their attacks or patterns, depending on whether they're submerged or not. Fish will flap helplessly on the ground if there is no water to house them, and on the inverse, they will charge at you. Frogs will release acidic bubbles and create even larger bubbles when in water. Spike ball enemies that shoot different projectiles when destroyed based on their status, and so much more. It's a really hectic stage that gets more fun the more you understand its inner workings. The music is the part of the stage I enjoy the most. A groovy track with a good melody will always win my favor to be honest. Segwaying to the mid-stage boss, we encounter a giant frog clinging to the ceiling. It will jump and reverse the placement of the water while distributing waves of acid bubbles at you. There are two levers in the room, allowing you to fight back against the boss's water manipulation. Doing so properly can allow you to stop his projectiles dead in their tracks. It's really easy once you get the hang of the gimmick, but it's still fun doing this lever and attack dance. I give him 10 head pats out of 10. The rest of water grab is the same only with more expansive layouts presenting more intricate uses of the gravity system. And it's a stage I enjoy, for the most part. It's a gravity stage that I feel has done really well, and that's saying a lot. Now that we've beaten Water Grab, we can move on to Echo Beast's stage. Echo Cave is a stage that starts strong with its jamming music. The primary gimmicks within Echo Cave are its burrowing mechanic, disappearing blocks, and its temporary platforms that can only appear after a button corresponding to them has been shot. When you enter any of the dirt tiles of the map, you begin to burrow. You are locked to four directions and have access to a single attack unique to burrowing. This attack gives you invulnerability and destroys anything in your path, and it can be used to help you move faster through the stage if you activate it before exiting the dirt. Of course, you're not the only one who is able to pass through the soil. There are mole enemies that will pursue you, and shield enemies that will follow a simple back and forth patrol, and cool spawner. Although not in the dirt, he is still an active threat to you through his ability to create smaller enemies. 30xx almost never lets me down, but this mini boss sure does. It's a fight against two enemies who function the exact same, shooting a circular pattern of crystals, then teleporting together. When one dies, the other doesn't become stronger or anything significant, at least as far as I've seen. But a bad mini boss doesn't spell a bad stage, and Echo Cave is a level I find to be fun, if a little chaotic with its layouts. Overall, a nice stage and one I will play over and over again. From Echo Cave, we find ourselves in Dustria, a facility that is hostile to everything living, including its workforce. The gimmicks of Dustria are springboards, explosive canisters, and a whole lot of crushers. The springboards are intuitive and are fun to use. Some are connected to each other, and you'll be bounced around like a ball until you hit stable ground. Commonly soaring in the air off of these boards are also the explosive tanks that are ceaselessly produced, causing damage in their wake, harming whoever is unfortunate enough to be in its path. The enemies of Dustria range from the workers who scale up and down the walls, throwing wrenches at any descending force to generators that produce electrical attacks along the surfaces, and a four-way turret that switches between two angles. None of these opponents are challenging beyond the highest tiers of the generator, but their strengths lie in this level's design. The chaotic nature of the springs and the explosive canisters can make navigation unsafe if not taken cautiously, or you could say fuck it we ball, and let the springboards take you wherever the hell they feel like. The soundtrack here is spectacular. The mood of an overwhelming force of industry and tech is captured so well. The track builds upon itself until completion, and then back to square one. Like an assembly line, putting together an object, the song too is constructed over and over again. Maybe I'm reading too deep into it, but I really do appreciate what was done for the soundtrack. The mini boss of Dustria is one that incorporates two of the gimmick presents within the stage that being canisters and springs. You've fought plenty of other brutally capitalist workers, but now try fighting one that's forklift certified. The forklift moves from side to side, launching a series of tanks that can also bounce around the room via the boards. Once whittled down, the employee mounting the forklift dies, 
leaving it to wreak havoc to any poor soul in its crossing. The mini-boss here is one of the better ones. With the fires of Dustria extinguished, we finally arrive at... Penumbra is the dark tower that looms within the city, and lying inside is the Guardian. Absolution. Its chambers are filled with priests and respawning black holes. Some are stationary and can be deactivated. Others pursue you constantly. The main gimmick within Penumbra are its sequential platform puzzles, a series of platforms that will go from red to blue to green, shifting to the next color in the sequence after you jump off of them. There are these much longer bricks that will change color after you hit a nearby button. Sometimes you'll encounter both of these in play at once, but more often than not, it'll be one or the other. In tandem with these color shifting platforms are the wall turrets and their coinciding redirecting background tiles. They can redirect both friendly and enemy projectiles alike and can be shifted with a charged attack. The background tiles are incorporated into the mid-stage boss fight, and even the color switch tiles on higher scaling. The mid-stage boss is a two-against-one situation, where you're confronted with the twins of light and dark, shooting crystals and moving across the room together in sync. The projectiles can be easily avoided, but if you're clever, you can switch the direction of the platforms and send their attacks right back at them, paralyzing them briefly and giving you more time to deal significant damage. While not challenging, it's a fight I enjoy more than the other twin-esque mini-bosses. Musically, Penumbra stands out for its darker and sinister atmosphere. The chorus has this melancholic energy to it that I just can't shake. The faint choirs and piano perfectly set the tone of this stage, and the air of finality is palpable. I love it so much. Did I mention you can commission City Fires for awesome music? Like this in your own games. Commission him. This is a threat. Now that we're done talking about stages, bosses, mechanics, visuals, music, all there is left to cover is the story of 30XX. Yeah. I'd personally love to dive into depth about the entirety of its story on a laser focus focused level. But there's a problem with that. This video would easily be eclipsed by that and go from being around an hour to a video that's going to be around six hours. Which, while I would enjoy doing that, I don't think that would make many people want to buy or play 30XX. Besides, I've spent several hours writing up the lore and realizing, wait, I'm an idiot. There's no way to abridge this without potentially ruining the story. So, as a wonderful solution, if you want to experience 30XX's story, I would highly recommend that you go check out the game yourself. It's far more complex and requires supplemental material from a few outside sources to really piece everything together. Another thing to note is that the story is quite divisive among fans of the game. There are people who love the story and think the game is well written, and there are an equally large crowd who think the narrative develops terribly and has no cohesion. For me, I'm somewhere in the middle of these two plateaus. I think the story is nice, and it was something I grinded to see through the end. But even when reviewing the lore, it's unfinished. And there are several writing errors that come up when you think about things for too long. And I don't want to make that a slate against the game. The game is a stellar experience all around, but the story isn't fully fleshed out. And clearly working with the multiverse trope caused a lot of issues. Chris has gone on record saying we won't be redoing the story from the ground up, at least not anytime soon. Never say never, I guess. But I'm open to re-examining our approach alongside the game's major updates. There's certainly a lot we could do better. I am glad Chris takes criticism and understands the feedback given to him. So with that in mind, even if I did do a lore segment, there's a very real possibility that in a year or two, the story would be wildly different, and I wouldn't want past me spouting incorrect information about the game's story in the future. So again, please consider buying 30XX and seeing the story for yourself. It's a very fun game to experience. And as long as you take into account the flaws with the story's writing, I'm sure you can still enjoy that too. Alrighty, it's time for my overall thoughts and a summary of my feelings towards 30XX. There's one objective truth that can't be denied, and it's that 30XX is one of the best Mega Man X inspired games out there. To go further, I would say it's one of the best roguelikes out on the market right now you can play. 
what flaws it possesses in its story are invisible in its gameplay loop with dazzling music and visuals layered on top of a game with limitless experiences what you have is a hidden gem you have all these other roguelikes i'm sure you yourself are already comparing it to whether that's the binding of isaac risk of rain enter the gungeon or hell maybe you're comparing it to something super obscure no one has ever heard about like dark blue warrior your yes that's a real game the point i'm trying to drive home at the end of the day is that 30xx is a fleshed out and mesmerizing game with its own identity an evolution of its precursor that was already decent on its own now cranked up to 11 with its developed mechanics and new systems providing not only a game for roguelike enjoyers but also other modes to facilitate a linear platformer experience there's a whole lot more i haven't gotten to talk about yet like entropy color palettes and the hidden characters whether you're a fan of the classic series X, Z, and ZX, I firmly believe that this game is perfect for you. Inside of 30XX, I assure you that you will find an experience that is gripping and fun all the way throughout. I've put way too much time into the recording process of this video. Throughout my time scripting and editing this together, I've tallied up an even larger total play time. I may have also recorded a bit too much footage for this. <laughs> That is pretty much everything I wanted to detail here. I hope you take the chance and buy 30XX. It's a wonderful game. And hey, you can always refund it if you don't like it. I am fully committed to the 30XX train, and I can't wait to see what Chris and his team add future updates. The game has me sincerely hooked, and I can't get enough of it. Thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate the continued support, and I hope this video was to your liking. I can't wait talk about the other ideas soon. You'll see I won't just cover my game related content here. I'm sure you'll enjoy them just as much as this one. With that, it's time to wrap up. Again, thank you everyone. This hobby has been nothing but joy for me. And remember, may the moon always shine for you.